morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, morning. Hi, and um, I'm Yue from uh, Faculty of Education, East China Normal University. And today, uh, we were very pleased uh, to welcome four uh, very important guests uh, from ECNU and Boston College and NIE um, for the, the sixth, actually, the sixth dialogue series of uh, global education themes. Um, the themes vision oh. of shared education futures, right? It's the six uh, episodes of the dialogue series. Um, so now I will leave the floor to uh, today's moderator, Professor uh, Chen Hongyan, uh, the Associate Professor, Institute of International and Comparative Education, East China Normal University. Let's welcome. Thank you very much. And good morning here in Shanghai and Singapore. Good morning in Boston. Your professor, Sandra Wolf, and, and daughter, Sandra Wu, Miss uh, Ramani Sarwana. Uh, so it's my, truly my honor to present here before you as a moderator, um, moderator today. And I guess uh, nowadays um, we are living in an interconnected world and it's important to have a dialogue and collaboration. And our forum is actually uh, is aimed to establish such kind of permanent uh, type, uh, like uh, mechanic for collaboration and dialogue among the top educational institutes in the world. And we hope to exchange the knowledges and gathering the experience all over the world to enhance our educational uh, dialogue. And today we are very honored to invite Professor Santa Wattham as our um, speaker. And uh, his topic is about the formative whole person education. And Professor Watham is the Dean of the School of Education and Human Development in uh, Boston College. He is also an award winner teacher, scholar, and documentary film uh, producer. He specializes in linguistic anthropology and educational ethnography with a particular expertise in how identity developed in human uh, interactions. And we are honored to, for the discussion part. We invited a young scholar uh, from Singapore, Dr. Sandra Wu, who is a lecturer at the politi uh, policy curriculum and leadership academic group and the uh, program leader for the Master of Arts. She is currently teaching students, teacher and master students at National Institute of Education at uh, the Institute of the Nanyang Techno uh, Technological University, Singapore. And we are honored to also invite our second discussant, who is Mr. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ramani Sanavanta, and he holds a master in educational management for the National Institute of Education. And it is also rejected as a doctor of education degree and specialized in educational leadership and, uh, uh, and cha change. So as your mo uh, moderator, my role is to ensure that our discussion remain productive, reflective, reflective for and inclusive. And uh, here we have a schedule for, for the coming hour. Uh, our professor, uh, uh, Watham, we ha have half an hour uh, talking. And after that, we have around 25 minutes for discussion. So Professor uh, Watham, it's your turn. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to Dean Yuan and Professor Chen and all the colleagues from e East China Normal University. I'm grateful to you for pulling this series together and for inviting me to be a part of it. I've had an opportunity to participate in some of the prior sessions, and they were very useful to hear from deans around the world about issues that they're thinking about. Thank you also to my colleagues from NIE in Singapore. It's great to have them with us, and I'm looking forward to their comments. So I'd like to speak to all of you today about what we call here at Boston College formative education. In the United States, and I think in other parts of the world, there is a bit of a malaise among many school children, K to 12, especially adolescents, but it affects children at many stages. There's often a lack of purpose or a disengagement among young people 
And it's not just young people who are struggling or who come from challenging backgrounds or lower socioeconomic strata, that children who face barriers, of course, have challenges in school many times. But what we're seeing nowadays also includes relatively successful, hardworking, and even privileged children. They seem not to have some sense of passion in their lives. They're often alienated. Sometimes this manifests itself in overwork, where they work all the time and they lose a sense of why they're doing it. In the U.S. and in some parts of Europe, sometimes you have children who burn out before they even get to university. By the time they get to university, they already feel as if they can't do it anymore. They're sick of studying and studying and studying. And this lack of a sense of purpose, this lack of connection with passion is something that I think is experienced in many places. And it causes problems for young people because then they don't go on and succeed and flourish the way we hope. So schools are a place where young people spend a lot of time. Schools are not the only cause of this alienation, this sense of malaise, for example, social media and relationships with friends are also sometimes a problem for young people. So they feel alienated, they feel a lack of purpose, they feel anxiety, not just because of what's happening in school, but also from things in the larger society, pressure from their parents, other sorts of social concerns. But schools, even though schools don't cause the whole problem, you would think that maybe they could help solve the problem because schools are a place where young people spend a lot of time. So maybe schools could help with this lack of purpose, this lack of passion, this sense of alienation. Unfortunately, however, schools have become the kinds of places that are not very good at dealing with this larger problem. So schools can't really do us as much good as we would like. This is a little slogan or a way to encapsulate why is it that schools can't help or aren't helping with this lack of purpose or this lack of passion. Dewey Lost Thorndike One is a reference to two famous philosophers or psychologists who worked in education about 100 or 125 years ago. Dewey had a complicated view of education, but he was interested in the development of whole children and how it is that children develop a sense of passion and engagement with their work. But for better or worse, Thorndike, who was a psychometrician and was very interested in scores and objective outcomes and was not really concerned with whole people, he was just concerned with academic achievement. Thorndike clearly won, at least in the United States, dominating our sense of what a secondary school in particular is supposed to be like. This heavy focus on measurable outcomes, on vocational training, training just for jobs, elaborate accountability systems to try to keep schools and children and teachers under control so that they have young people succeed with simpler metrics. So because Dewey lost in Thorndike 1, we find ourselves in a situation where schools are not really able to do what we would like them to do, that schools are really focused on instrumental reasoning. They're focused on trying to help young people succeed with these very measurable outcomes. And of course, there's nothing wrong with young people learning subject matter knowledge. We all think young people should develop knowledge and skills. That's crucial. The problem isn't that schools teach knowledge and skills, it's that they teach that to the exclusion of everything else. And they're completely focused on this narrower vision of what it would be to be a successful person. So educational institutions like schools have gotten really focused on measurable outcomes, narrow subject matter goals, and as a result, they do not attend much to young people's emotional states, to their relationships, to their ethical development, to their spiritual puzzles. Young people have many aspects of their lives neglected. Schools aren't doing a very good job helping with that. And so we get the alienation that I described up front, the lack of a sense of purpose. So I wanna to talk to you this evening or this morning for you all in Asia about formative education, something that we practice here at Boston College to try to give you a sense of what this alternative is and how we feel as if it's a better way to address this challenge of a lack of meaning, a lack of purpose, a lack of passion among young people. So formative or whole person education is just a reference to a whole set of capacities or dimensions that young people and all of us have. We all 
have relationships and challenges with our relationships. We all have emotions and we have to figure out how to manage them. We all face ethical challenges. We have to figure out what's the right thing to do and what's the wrong thing to do. We all have spiritual puzzles. We wonder about what is life about? What's the meaning of my life? What should I be doing to give me a sense of fulfillment? Those are universal things. All humans have those sorts of challenges and puzzles. In school, we sometimes pretend as if young people don't have any of that stuff. Young people have no emotions. They have no relationships. They have no ethical problems. They have no spiritual puzzles. They're just like brains learning content knowledge and we ignore everything else. But of course, the young people in schools do have all those other things going on and they need to learn, they need to develop up in these other ways. You were not born. A young child does not know how to manage emotions, doesn't know how to solve ethical challenges, doesn't know how to deal with spiritual puzzles. That's a developmental process. They have to develop ways of managing those things. And schools can engage with that because the young people that we're teaching subject matter also have these other processes and challenges going on at the same time. So a whole person education is about an education that tries to deal with all of these things at once, it tries to facilitate development along all these dimensions and not just subject matter knowledge or job training. Globally, there has been a real upsurge in interest in whole person education over the last decade and a half or so. I've put a few of the terms on this slide. So formative education is the term that we use at Boston College, but some places talk about well-being or character education, flourishing, whole child approaches, civic education, social and emotional learning, and there are other terms as well that are picked up in different places. But we have colleagues around the world who have noticed this lack of a sense of meaning and purpose, this lack of passion, this need for more holistic development. And many different school systems, national school systems, are trying to engage with it. I know our colleagues in Singapore have quite a robust set of educational activities in their schools around developing well-being for young people. It's quite an impressive system that they've built in Singapore around these issues. Finland is known for doing these things well, but all over the world, people are engaged with these challenges and they've decided schools need to do more of this. And I just wanna talk a little bit about how we do it here at Boston College. So the Lynch School of Education and Human Development, where I'm Dean, is a place where when we work with our students, whether they be undergraduate students or graduate students, and when we prepare young people to be teachers or counselors out in the world after they leave us, we really are focused on education as this multidimensional process where we're trying to facilitate holistic development, whole purpose development, whole person development toward purposeful lives, toward meaningful learning. So let me talk to you a little bit about what that's like. Formation or formative education as we see it is the guided development of the whole human being. So you see here, I have these several dimensions that I described interpersonally, emotionally, ethically, and spiritually. We try to foster these kinds of development holistically. And I'll try to give you a sense in a minute of how it is that we do that. We're trying to help these young people you see here in the picture, a group of undergraduates. We like to take students away on retreats, which is something I'll discuss. We like to give them an opportunity to reflect on why they're doing what they're doing, what their larger purpose in life is. Informative education is about that. It's about challenging young people to engage with questions about purpose. It's not telling people what to believe. Formative education does not say, we know what a meaningful life is, and we're going to tell you what you have to do or what you have to believe in. That's not what it's about. It's about getting young people to ask the questions and answer for themselves. I don't believe it's my job to tell a young person what they have to believe about what's ultimately important in life. They might be very drawn to ecology and saving the planet, or they might be very drawn toward humanistic approaches and serving other people. They might be drawn toward social change, toward making societies more just. They might be drawn toward a religious vision, a vision that has to do with God and the purpose of humans in a divine universe. It's not my job to tell them that they should believe in ecology or humanism or divine visions. That's not my job. But it is my job to tell them they have to ask the question of what is ultimately important to them. What is it that they feel is worth devoting their life to? 
What do they feel will give them a fulfilling life over time? And so we at Boston College, when we do formative education, we encourage people, we get people to address these questions about ultimate meaning, about what they're called to do, what they feel drawn to do with their lives. And if a young person comes to our business school, for example, and you ask this person, what do you want to do with your life? And the student answers, I want to make a lot of money. That's my goal in life. We try to get them to ask the question. We're not opposed to that. It's okay to want to get a good job and make some money, but we think that's not enough. So we ask this young person, do you really think you're going to be happy when you're 50 years old or 60 years old and all you did was pursue money your whole life? Is that enough to give you a sense of fulfillment? And often the answer is no. You know, there are other things that they're aiming toward that have a deeper, they feel deeper to them. They feel more meaningful. So that's our job is to get them to ask these questions, to try to force them not to give superficial answers and to explore what's really important to them. We try to engage students in formative education in various ways. There are service activities. Our students go around the world and try to engage with a company, other people in various projects around the world. We also have an interesting quantitative project where we've tried to build an instrument to measure young people's progress toward leading a life of meaning and purpose. And we use it with our Boston College students, and we've used it at some other universities in the U.S. as well. It would be really nice to have a reliable and valid measure of whether or not young people are progressing toward meaning, leading meaningful lives. And we think we have a pretty good start on an instrument like that, and we've spent a lot of time trying to make that work. And I will talk to you about retreats when we get to the issues here. So I'm going to give you two examples of the kinds of things that we do in order to do this formative education, this holistic development of young people. The first one has to do with retreats. So vocational discernment, I apologize, it's, it's Jesuit speak, it's jargon. Vocational discernment means the process of trying to figure out what you want to pursue with your life, what sort of career would be meaningful for you. And so one of the things we try to do with our undergraduate students is we give them many opportunities to engage with these questions about what would be a fulfilling lifetime for you? What could you commit yourself to as a career that would give you a sense of fulfillment across time so that as you get toward the end of your life, you can look back and feel as if there was something worthwhile that gave you a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning in your life. So one of the ways we do this is we do it through retreats. And there's a particular treat, retreat I want to tell you about that we call halftime. So halftime normally happens at the end of the second year of an undergraduate career. So they're about halfway through their four-year undergraduate program with us. There's a quote here. It says, the uninterrupted life is not worth living. This is a Jesuit saying. It means that you need to stop your daily life once in a while and step back and take the time to think about things that you don't think about when you're just going and doing what you do in daily life. In daily life, we have families, we have children, we have work, we have goals, we're trying to build our careers, we're trying to network, you have to cook dinner, that there's always something happening in daily life. And that's fine. We have to do our jobs and we have to feed our families. But you can't really stop and think about what's ultimately important in your life if you're too busy making dinner or if you're too busy dealing with your coworkers or working on your latest project. So we like to give students an opportunity to stop what they're doing and we take them physically away from campus. Usually it's two days, usually it's a two day overnight. The university owns property and we take them away to this property. It's beautiful there, there's a river, there's 80 acres, there's woods, there's a nice big house. And so we'll take 40 students or so to this house They'll stay overnight for two nights, and they'll engage in various activities there. The activities include groups. So they get in groups with eight peers, and they talk about some of the questions. There are individual activities where by yourself you write in a journal or you listen to music or you meditate. There are testimonials where other people, faculty or administrators who are older, will come and tell stories about their lives. Or seniors, people at the end of their college careers, will come and tell stories about their experiences. 
And we structure this retreat around three questions. So the questions are here. So what are you good at means if you're going to devote your life to something, it should be something that you're good at, that you have the capacity, the aptitude to do it well. The second one is what brings you joy? So what is it in life that gives you a sense of joy and fulfillment? And the third one is what does the world need you to do? There's something out there that the world needs. And for different people, it will be different things. But you should be pursuing something that the world actually needs. If you really love doing something and nobody wants you to do it and nobody cares about it, it's probably not going to give you fulfillment over time because you're going to need a community to support you as you pursue that activity. So the idea between behind these three questions is that if you find something that you're good at, that brings you joy, and that the world needs, that may be a good candidate for a career for you to pursue. And by giving the undergraduates an opportunity to go away for 48 hours, to talk with their peers, to hear from people like me who will tell stories about the choices I made in my life and how I feel about my career, we give the undergraduates a chance to reflect on this larger sense of purpose, what would be fulfilling for them over time. So that's one way in which we try to do formative education is through these sorts of retreat activities. The second and the last example that I'll give is this new department. So as a dean, you very rarely get to start a new department. You know that the departments in a university are pretty set. We know what they are. They tend to be similar across schools. And you got a bunch of faculty in each one, so you can't mess with them. You can't shut them down and open them up because the faculty get very upset with you. And so we tend not to be able to start new ones. But I recently had the opportunity to create a new department, and we're calling it the Department of Formative Education. So it's a department that is devoted in its scholarly mission to this process of formative or holistic whole person development. And I wanted to tell you in this department. So this is an entity where we ask certain kinds of questions. We have three examples here on the left-hand side of the slide about how we should do formative or whole person education, how we cultivate community, how we nurture vision and values. But these are just examples that there are many questions that one could ask about what is optimal? What is the best sort of human development? What is the best way to help human beings develop such that they can live meaningful and purposeful lives? And this department is devoted to faculty members who ask these kinds of questions. They ask them both empirically and normatively. So the department has a philosopher and a philosopher asks normative questions about why should we do this and why should we do that? We also have a theologian in this department who's asking philosophical normative questions about ethically what's good and what's right. So we have people doing normative work, trying to figure out what we should to do, should aim for in our education. But we also have social scientists. So we have a historian who studies early Jesuit education, how they used to do holistic education in Europe 500 years ago. We have an anthropologist who studies in East Africa, madrasas in East Africa, so Islamic schooling and holistic spiritual development in Islamic schools in East Africa. And we have, um, we're also, we have a psychologist who's a cultural psychologist who studies psychological processes of the development of a sense of purpose over time. So we have empirical and normative approaches to these kinds of questions. And it's an interdisciplinary unit that allows colleagues to work with each other about these larger questions of what is human development as a whole process, not little pieces of human development, not just cognitive development, not just emotional development, but holistic development. What is it? What should it be? How can we facilitate it from various perspectives? So this slide is meant to represent the people in the department. We have the formative humanities. So that's philosophers. The historian thinks of himself as a humanist. The theologian is also in the humanities. So we have the formative humanities. We have developmental technology because we actually have a computer scientist in this department. She's someone who teaches young children how to code, how to learn machine language, to tell computers to execute actions. But she's really interested in coding, not as a technical process of just learning how to make a machine do something, but 
as a process that's kind of like learning a language and a language is always woven into ethical and relational choices about who you're talking to and how you're talking to them. And so she does technology, but it's technology in a more humanistic way. And we also have anthropology and cultural psychology, studying how people around the world in different societies spend their time facilitating development. Fostering development is a human universal. Humans always have young people and they always have to help the development of those young people. And so we're interested in how it's done in various parts of the world in various ways. I have here in these various questions or points other descriptions of things that I've tried to articulate for you about how we don't just want an instrumental approach to education. Formative education says education is not just, I want to get the student from point A to point B. I want to help the student learn this or get that job or build that skill. Knowledge and skills are crucial, but they're not enough. So we also want young people to develop some bigger sense of who they are, why they're here, what they're meant to do, what they're called to do. And that process is something that requires going beyond instrumental reasoning to thinking about the ends of education, what humans ought to be like, and how it is we can get them there. It's a hard job. It's much easier to teach people simple things than it is to help facilitate this sort of holistic development. And the department is a group of scholars who work together in an interdisciplinary way to try to address that question of how can we foster holistic development? How can we help people become more whole human beings? So those are two examples of how we do formative education here at Boston College. One about the retreats, we take students away and get them to reflect on questions. And the second one about this department and how it is that we have collected a group of faculty and students to think about these deeper questions of what holistic education ought to be and how it is that we can do it more effectively. So what I've tried to articulate for all of you is that I think around the world over the last decade or decade and a half, there have been a whole series of reactions against this narrow instrumental view of education as just about content knowledge just about training for jobs. Formative education, a more holistic sense of what we're up to, our version of it at Boston College has to do with purpose and community. We think that young people need to develop a sense of purpose and we think that's our job in the university. We don't think our job, some people say, oh yeah, the families or the churches will teach people about purpose. In school, we just teach them about knowledge. We don't believe that. We think that knowledge is inevitably connected to, woven in with, these questions of purpose. And so we try to help facilitate their development across dimensions, relational, emotional, ethical, and spiritual. We feel as if we need to be ambitious here. We shouldn't just say, we can't do that. It's too hard to facilitate that sort of development. It is hard, but we think it's our responsibility and something that we need to focus on. We're hoping that BC can be a hub. We do research on this, we build we build programs for students that try to foster this sort of holistic development. It's something that we know about and we're trying to get better at it as we move forward. So that's what I have to say. Thank you all very much. And I look forward to the comments. Wow, thank you very much, uh, Professor Watham. I found this program I mean, very meaningful, especially after the COVID-19s. Especially, for example, in China, there were more young people who were struggled uh, by this depressed. So I guess this, uh, uh, this, uh, you know, the critique on the one dimension, we call it one dimension education, the instrumental oriented education should be a little bit adjust <laughs> at least. And your program really inspired us uh, to think about how can we not only put it in as a, as a philosophic thing, but how can we put it into practice? For example, in China already, uh, in Confucianism, we already have this so-called who, uh, who uh, human beings education. In German, as far as I know, they also have this concept of uh, about building, uh, building. This is uh, also a, a concept from Humboldt. But how can we put this into practice? Who will help us to put this, to, to build this uh, concept? I guess it's very meaningful. So now later on, I would like to invite uh, 
Dr. San, um, Sandra Wu, uh, who will be our discussant to continue this talk, dialogue with Professor. And also, yeah, uh, Ms. Uh, Sarana Vamna uh, to join us as a discussant. Yeah, please. Hey, thank you, Professor Chen. And thank you so much, Professor uh, Watham, for your inspiring and insightful sharing on formative education. It's very thought-provoking and really makes us think about the fundamental question of education, which is what is the purpose of education. And you have given us an answer, um, you know, to that, which is formative education. So uh, we, from your sharing, we learned about, you know, the whole person education and how it's multifaceted, multidimensional. So uh, one question I would like to ask is, Actually, I have three questions. So perhaps the first question I'd like to ask is, how do you measure um, progress, you know, um, of towards meaning and purpose in your students? Because you mentioned you have developed uh, an instrument and I'm really very excited to learn about that. Mm -hmm. it, the instrument is, it's a scenario-based instrument. So the way it works is there's a little story. You read a little story about a person. So you hear about so-and-so and what she does and why she does what she does and how she thinks of herself. And you read that paragraph and then it asks you to place yourself with respect to some dimension of meaning and purpose. So the instrument will ask you, as you think about your own life, are you a lot more of this than this person or about the same as her or a lot less than her? And we've broken down the construct into several facets and each of the facets has several of these scenarios, and then you get an overall score about where you place yourself on these different dimensions through the stories. So it's all done through these stories. And we've, we've, you know, it's been normed. It seems to be reliable, and we think the validity is pretty good. So it seems to be working relatively well with the undergraduates we've tried it on so far. Thank you so much, Professor. So uh, because education should begin in early childhood, um, in your opinion, how can we begin uh, formative education from early childhood? Yeah, that's a good question. The <clears throat> In some ways, it's easy because in kindergarten, we teach kids all sorts of stuff, right? You're not just teaching them subject matter. You're teaching them to get along with each other and to try to make friends and not to be selfish and to control themselves when they get upset. And so in, in some ways, early childhood education is already more holistic. It's later on that we try to um, put get other dimensions out when we do schooling at the high school level. But I think it's worth trying to engage even young people in some of these questions about purpose. Um, when my child was in second grade, which would mean that he was seven years old. I went into his classroom because they invited all the parents to come in if you want and talk about your job, you know, tell the little kids about what you do and why you do it. And so I went in and what I did was I tried to ask the children a question, which is the same as the questions I would ask some of my university students in class. So the question I asked is, are humans fundamentally different than animals? And it's a hard question, you know, because in some ways we treat dogs as if they're different. You'll punish your dog in a way you wouldn't punish your child, for example. But in other ways, a dog is a member of the family. We treat the pets as if they're just like people, you know? And so it's a hard question. How are people different than animals? What's fundamentally different? Do they learn differently? If you're trying to help a young child learn something, would you do it the same way you would try to teach a dog to learn something? And that's a question about which reasonable people could differ. So I was trying to talk to these seven-year-olds about this question of learning and whether humans and animals learn the same. And the teacher was horrified. She said, you can't ask them that question. They can't think about that. That's too complicated a question for them. But actually, that was not true, that several of those students were really very interested in talking about this question of humans and what makes a human different than an animal and what's really important to them and that was a question that's kind of like a formative education question about what's important in life. And I think even young children can engage in some of those conversations. You have to adjust them because some things they don't understand yet. 
But I actually think with young kids, you could start them puzzling about these kinds of questions. What are you good at? What do you really enjoy? What out there in the world do you think needs to be done? How could you contribute to it? They're not going to make decisions yet when they're seven years old about what to do with their lives, but it's not a bad thing for them to start thinking about. Thank you so much, Professor. Indeed, and when you shared about the teacher's reaction, it really reflects the, the lens she used to view children or her students and the image of the child. So this brings me to the next question. How do we um, prepare teachers to teach formative education? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it's not easy because here in the US, and I imagine in other places too, they have the government has a very strict set of requirements. So if you want to be a teacher, you have to meet all these requirements and they tell you which courses you have to teach them and what knowledge they have to have and so forth. Some of what they expect is perfectly reasonable. You know, a teacher should understand about child development and so forth and so on. Some of it is a little bit too detailed. You know, there's a little bit too much that's asked for. It's um force children just to jump through hoops to not have to actually think in broader ways. But if you can carve out the space within your program, what we try to do it here is we try to make formative education a theme throughout the program. So it's not that we have one course where they learn formative education. We try to do it such that whatever you're learning, you're learning about how to teach science, that you should think about how you teach science in a formative way, that science can be taught as a set of facts. It can be taught through projects. If you teach it through projects, you can get people to engage with questions of what is going on in that project. They have to work with other people in relationship. For example, our undergraduates recently were competing. They were developing a project on what we call fast fashion. Fast fashion means you can order a piece of clothing and they'll make exactly what you want right then because the manufacturing processes have been adjusted so that they can create what are essentially disposable clothes. You know, you get it in your head, you want something orange with a lion on it and they'll make it for you. And then you probably wear it a few times and you get rid of it. And the students were doing a project on the ecological consequences of fast fashion for especially places in Africa, which is where a lot of this stuff gets dumped once people throw it out or stop wearing it. And so that was a project where we have young people. A lot of them are going to be teachers. We're trying to engage them in a project, and it's a project that has clear ethical dimensions to it. You have to think about what's comfortable for you, what's convenient for you, and the implications that has for other people elsewhere in the world and the implications it has for the larger environment and what you know our children and grandchildren will have to live with. And so what we try to do in our program is we get people to think about formative questions throughout whatever it is that they're focusing on. And we don't always succeed, you know, it's not perfect, but we're trying to do it in a consistent way such that this is a big theme that you keep coming back to. So whatever you're teaching as a faculty member, you should be reflecting on how does this appear in my content and how can I help young people pursue these kinds of questions? So one answer to your question is we try to bring up questions about formation or holistic development throughout the curriculum. And a second way is there are certain kinds of activities that tend to lend themselves to this kind of reflection. So I described a retreat and taking students away. Um, we have these things here, which are sort of small group discussion sections that are designed to create reflection. So you wanna give people an opportunity and you wanna push them to ask deeper questions about whatever it is that you're teaching. And so there's something at BC called PODS, P-O-D-S. I have no idea what it stands for. It's an acronym, you know, but it's some sort of discussion. It's an intense reflective discussion that's added on to a class where a group of students will get together and reflect on the assumptions they're making and the larger implications of what they're talking about. So the class isn't just about let's learn this history that we're learning and let's you know get a good grade on the test because we remember the history. It's also what implications does that history have for stuff that's going on today 
And how can we, and they have to do this, they have to participate in this activity. So another way to do it is to try to think up kinds of interactions for students, kinds of activities for students that encourage more holistic reflection and development, and to try to build those into the courses as you teach them. Thank you so much, Professor. This uh, brings to mind how in our Singapore's uh, education system, we have character and citizenship education. And here at NIE, when we uh, teach our pre-service teachers, who uh, our student teachers who will be going to, into the schools, uh, we teach them that every teacher is a CC teacher, a character and citizenship education teacher. So in some ways, I do see some parallels in what you're doing at Boston College as well as at NIE and how it's so important to role model uh, critical thinking, reflection and questioning techniques because thinking teachers will help cultivate thinking students. Thank you so much for sharing that with us and the various possible strategies you can use and apply in our teacher training as well. Uh, so I shall hand the time over to Romani for her to also have some time to discuss and ask you questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sandra. And uh, thank you, Dr. Stanton Waltham. I would like to express my sincere appreciation for your enlightening presentation on the holistic education and formative education. Um, thanks again for the in insightful sharing on the challenges of young people's sense of purpose and the role of education in addressing it. I was particularly impressed by your focus on the issues of young people's lack of purpose uh, is indeed crucial in today's society. Uh, considering the emphasis on the holistic development in education, I'm curious about its connection to leadership development. How does the concept of formative education, which focuses on holistic development, intersect with the development of leadership skills and qualities, especially in young people? And I do have a sub-question though, uh, that would be now any insights or examples you can provide on how holistic education contributes to the cultivation of leadership qualities? Are there any specific strategies or insight? Appreciate your thoughts. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question about leadership. Um, one of the things we do, so some programs at Boston College are explicitly designed to prepare leaders so, for instance, in the business school, they're trying to prepare young people who are going to go out and lead organizations. And in the School of Social Work, sometimes they're trying to prepare young people who are going to go out and lead agencies or nonprofit organizations of various kinds. So we try, when we work with those young people who are going to be leaders, we try to help them develop this deeper sense of purpose. We try to help them reflect on what's important so that they don't lose sight of the larger goals of their organizations that they're going to go on to lead. So that's one dimension of what we do. We're training people to be leaders and we're trying to get them to be holistic people who are also kind of formative in their approaches in their own contexts. But you also are asking a question about, can you do leadership development alongside formative development? And I think the answer to that is yes, that as someone is developing to become a leader, if you're trying to foster the skills of leadership, good leadership does involve some of the same things that we're talking about with formative development, that leaders have to be aware of their emotional states. If you let your emotional states take over, you can't really lead effectively because you can't react to the problem at hand because you're overwhelmed by the emotions that are going on. And leadership is centrally about relationships. And so you have to be aware, you have to be emotionally intelligent enough to recognize the relationships you have with people, what they're thinking. You have to be empathic with their sense of emotional reaction to you. And if you can't pick up on that. So to develop as a leader, you need to develop these various dimensions of yourself. Being a good leader doesn't just mean knowing a lot about leadership theory or something. It requires these practical skills of managing emotions, managing relationships, and it also requires ethics, that leadership also requires a sense of ethics of what is right and what's wrong and what a valuable purpose is and what a morally suspect purpose is. And so I think that these two approaches could complement each other, that you could do leadership development in a formative way by trying to help people build their capacities in these different areas of 
emotions and ethics and relationships, and you could try to help them build those capacities in themselves as a way to encourage them to be able to be a leader who also is able to foster that sort of holism in their people. A lot of organizations nowadays are trying hard to do holistic development of their employees. They're trying to help employees get a sense of purpose at work. It's a way to try to keep employees happy and engaged and to keep them from leaving the organization and taking another job. So we get we hear a lot about organizations that are spending time with purpose and a deeper sense of purpose. It's become popular in the last decade or so. And leaders have to be able to answer that need. They have to be able to facilitate that in the people who work for them. Otherwise, they can't succeed in this sort of a context. So I think leadership and formative education can complement each other. I think some of our programming in different parts of the university tries to build on that, but it would probably take more work to articulate exactly how those two things could best go together. Yes, thank you very much. I think I agree with you because we need to make sure that these are distinct as, as well as how when they fuse together becomes a great um, in inspiration as well as an educational format. So in my capacity as both an educator and a doctoral student, I discovered that your insights regarding holistic education closely resonate with my research focus, which is on um, centers around servant leadership and your ability to articulate, uh, articulate this complex uh, concepts in a clear and engaging manner was truly commendable. So once again, thank you very much for sharing your expertise. And I look forward to exploring these ideas further in my current workplace, as well as in my research. Thank you. So now um, I would like to hand over back to the uh, organizers. Yeah, sure, yeah. Actually, we also got a couple of nice questions from the audience. They were very interested in this discussion. So there were many different questions. I will put it simple. First, one author, uh, one audience asked the question very critic. Uh, for her, uh, she uh, she said, as the well-being, the concept itself is a person is very subject term is also very vague term. So how can education develop well-being of a person? And when do we say that say, someone is at the state of the well-being? Actually, this is pro probably the, the conceptual. How we understand the concept of the formative, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's professor. A, it's a good question. Um, mm -hmm. Well-being is inherently a normative concept. In other words, we can't answer it just with science. You can't just give a scientific account of this is what humans are are like when they have well-being. There are some mm -hmm. aspects of us that you can give a purely scientific account. You know that health, for example, that we know when our body is functioning properly, we know what a properly functioning heart does. And if it's not functioning well, then we have some sense of what's wrong with it. But a human life is much more complicated than a heart, you know, and in order to have a successful flourishing life, a life of well-being, we have to have some vision of what humans ought to do. And of course, people vary in their accounts of what humans ought to do. And so, as I was saying earlier, I don't think it's my job to tell everybody what they ought to believe or what is going to make them have a sense of well-being. I don't think I can do it because I don't know enough about all those people. Even if we just talk about my country, the United States, there are huge numbers of diverse visions of what an optimally functioning human is, what a human with well-being is. And so, as a result... We, as an educator, we can't go to somebody and say, you have to believe this, and then you'll be happy, and then you'll have well-being. And the reason is that we might not understand them, and we might not understand their context well enough to be able to prescribe for them what will lead to well-being. But as I said, I think it's possible for us to ask the questions, to get people to engage with some of these questions such that they can answer them for themselves. So we can try to get them to reflect on purpose and what would give them a sense of purpose without dictating to them what counts as the right kind of purpose. Now, we do, we do have to make a distinction between, broadly speaking, what counts and what doesn't count. So I said before, if you have a young person who's majoring in business and they say their goal in life is to make as much money as possible, um, we have a saying in the United States, sometimes it's on a bumper sticker on the back of a car. It says, he who dies with the most toys wins. 
which means that you succeed in life if you have more stuff than everybody else. And we believe that that's not good enough. In other words, that doesn't count as well-being. And that's a normative judgment. I've just made an ethical or normative judgment about that. And somebody might believe that just earning a lot of money is good enough and that you can have well-being just if you have as much money as possible. And to that person, I don't know what to say, that I just can't, like, if they really believe that, okay, you know, that's their life. But then I don't know if they're going to benefit so much from having me ask the kinds of questions that I can ask. And I have some colleagues, there are some professors, not only in this country, in many countries who are very, very cynical. You know, they think that everything is bad and evil and everything in society is about exploitation and taking advantage of other people. And if you really believe that human life is nothing but competition and exploitation and oppression, and that's it, then formative education really can't work because it depends on a certain, you have to have faith in something. You have to have faith in some larger vision. And if you don't have faith in any larger vision, then I can't do, I can't really help you that much. And I can't prove that you're wrong. Like if somebody believes that everything in human life is about trying to do better than other people and compete with other people and exploit other people. If you really believe that, I can't prove to you that that's not true. We have some evidence that seems to support that theory, but my approach to formative education can't help because you have to have faith in something better, deeper, broader than that. You have to have hope about some more positive outcome in human life. And so I'm not saying that those people who are all cynical are wrong. I'm saying, I just don't know what to do with them. And so maybe they need their own university. They can all go be depressed together, you know, mm -hmm. but he, in our vision of things, we have to make some judgment that some things are really worth pursuing. They can sustain a fulfilling life. They can sustain well-being. And that is normative. The person who asked the question is right, that that is a judgment that we have to make that distinction. But once people have some vision they're willing to subscribe to and explore some sense of larger purpose, then we can work with them without forcing them into our vision. Yeah. Okay. So now there are another practical problem. One audience asks, what channels do you do we expect from the formative education when it's in implementation? So that like when you practice, what is the main challenge? Yeah. Well, it depends on the society you're in, for example. we Some of my colleagues here recently did a study of Hyukshin schools, which are in South Korea. And Hyukshin schools are holistic schools. They're trying to engage children in civic processes, in engaging in community, building a sense of community in more holistic visions and not just be about learning content all the time. Now, you all probably know enough about South Korea to know that it's a place where it's intensely competitive and outcomes on the exams, the college entrance exams are critical and students study in school all day and then they go to Hagwon, they go to school after school in order to study into the evening because they want to succeed. So there's a big challenge in Korea, which is that you could offer the most wonderful whole person education but the students and the parents a lot of times don't want it. And the reason they don't want it is because they're in this very competitive setting where they really want to get into the best university. And in order to do that, they have to ignore everything else. They can't have emotions. They can't have relationships. They can't worry about spiritual questions. They just have to focus on succeeding because everybody else is competing so hard. So that's one kind of challenge to formative education is that sometimes people don't they don't think they have time for it, or they don't think it's important. They think the most important thing is just the subject matter knowledge, the exam results, and the success down the road. That's one kind of challenge. I just described a second ago a certain sort of cynicism, which is another challenge, that we have people who are just very cynical. They really believe that anytime I tell you a story about some sense of purpose, something that gives me a sense of purpose, they'll say, oh, that's, you know, that's, that's silly. We don't really believe that, that, you know, you can't really believe that that doesn't make sense. That's just ideology. That's just oppression. That's, that's not reasonable. That's not realistic. So cynicism is another thing that is a challenge. If you have people who are really very cynical, 
then you you often can't make progress with them. And then the last thing I'll say about challenges is that it's hard work. I mean, it's hard to do this. It's it's hard to teach somebody subject matter. So to teach you how to understand biology is hard, but to teach you how to become a good human being is harder. It's a hard thing to do, to figure out how we could do this more holistic development. And we don't have a lot of established curriculum for how to do it. And so it's difficult to try to build these skills to take students on a retreat and get them to reflect on these questions is a difficult thing to structure. And we have people who've been doing it for 20 years, so they're really very good now at how to structure that so that it will be productive for people. But you can't just try it at home. You know, you can't just have a retreat and take a bunch of people and expect it to go well if you don't really know what you're doing. Mm, yeah, so thank you very much. Another question, also very critical. For this audience, she says that probably much of your proposals works for the privileged person, but what about the people from the developed or underdeveloped uh, countries? Probably their education is much look like more than like trainings. So what might be an uh, ethnic defensible agenda of engaging with people in developed contexts that might not cause the uh, fractures in society? And what's your opinion? Yeah. yeah, it's true that this can seem elitist. It can seem as if certain people have the luxury to do this and other people don't have the luxury to do it. And mm -hmm. it is true that if you have students who have huge needs, then you can't spend all your time getting them to think about philosophy or something because there are other issues that you need to attend to. So... I wouldn't want formative education to become an excuse for ignoring the injustices and the needs that many people have in my country and in other countries around the world. Mm. But I also wouldn't want to say that people who lack resources shouldn't think about some of these bigger questions, that questions about meaning and purpose are important. Everybody thinks about them. Even if you are in a, a situation where you are being pushed hard just to survive day to day, that it's part of being human to engage with these questions. And so I wouldn't want to give people an education that was just practical, that just gave them skills and left no space for this. It could be that there are certain things people absolutely have to get, and that's what you have to do first. But I hope there's at least some space for these other sorts of questions as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much. And the last question, actually there were many questions, but due to the time limitation, the last question might be, because they were very interested in how did you come this idea about formative education? What kind of philosophy influenced you to have this uh, practice in your career? Yeah. Well, um, so Boston College is a Jesuit university, and this tradition that the university comes out of has an emphasis on this sort of holistic development. So it's 500 years old that they've been building schools that engage in this sort of development. And I found it personally very appealing, this notion of trying to get people to ask questions about larger purposes in their lives. It's something that I think can be productive for me. So it spoke to me. But there are you yourself mentioned traditions. The German building tradition, for example, is something that also has this notion of cultivation, trying to cultivate a sense of personhood. So that's a very different tradition than the Jesuit tradition that Boston College rests on, but it has some similar kinds of emphases in it. And so I spent a lot of time reading German philosophy when I was younger, and so maybe that prepared me for engaging with some of these questions. But the Jesuit tradition is another one that helps foster it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other philosophy might influence your career? Like, because some uh, some audience are very interested in this for philosophy thinking, and they would they would like to read more about this philosophy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a, so 
there's an article that was published in your journal there at ECNU, the ECNU Review of Education. Mm -hmm. some, some students and I published a paper in 2020, in 2020, on whole person education. It's sort of a review of different approaches, very diverse approaches to doing whole person education. And so mm -hmm. if people wanted to look up that reviews some basic questions about what should go into whole person education. And that was published in your journal a few years ago. So I would recommend that. Mm -hmm. And Boston College also on the website, it has various materials that describe the approach and what's in what's involved in whole person education. Um, again, we just have one perspective or one tradition on it. But the paper in the ECNU review actually tries to engage with multiple traditions, not just my tradition or our tradition, but various ways of thinking about whole person development. So that might be a useful starting place. Mm. Okay. So due to the time limitation, uh, so we need to close the discussion. But I guess there were many audience who are still interested in the topic. You can just follow Professor Watson uh, uh, in addition uh, and just uh, look up for the Journal of Educational Review on our university website, download the paper directly, and you can find uh, more about Professor Watson's idea. Thank you very much, Professor Watson. Thank you very much for the audience. And also thank you very much, Professor uh, Dr. Wu uh, Saravanta. Uh, I found this discussion is very insightful and uh, we shared uh, invaluable insights and for, for the connection that uh, translates borders and cultures. In closure, I'm confident that the idea exchange here will ripple out around create positive change in our community and also our educational field. So thank you again for this active participation and the wonderful uh, lectures. Thank you very much. Yeah, and take care. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you, ECNU as well. Thank you very much. Bye bye.